All right. Uh, my name is Mike Klinsling. I am the owner and founder of Head Start Basketball, and I'm also the host of the Hoop Heads podcast. And I've been involved in basketball for my entire life. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to play Division One basketball at Kent State University back a long time ago now, Frank, 1988 to 1992. And after I got done playing, I uh, wanted to have a way to give back to the game and continue to be able to impact and and use the game to, to do the great things that it has done for me in my life. So uh, I actually had a friend who played basketball in the NBA. Uh, his name was Scott Roth, and he grew up in a community near me. And Scott had a basketball camp in my home community when I was a kid. And I worked at it, and I looked around, and I said, boy, if you know Scott's here in my home community, and he was kind of a fringe NBA player. And at that point, he had, although he had graduated from a nearby high school, he had been gone from the area probably for – close to 10 years. And I thought, well, if he can get this many kids to come to his basketball camp, you know, my name should still be good here in my hometown. And so I'm have, I'll maybe get it started. And so I ended up starting the camps. Actually, uh, my idea was to have it be sort of a neighborhood camp where kids could ride their bikes to their local elementary school. and We do the camp. So the first year I did it, did the camp. Uh, I actually did seven different sessions of camp at each of the seven elementary schools at the time that we had in our community. And that was how it started. And then over time, uh, we ended up consolidating and doing it for a time at the junior high and then eventually at the high school. And right now I'm currently at the rec center. But most of my camps have been for youth players uh, who are in elementary school, uh, boys and girls. Uh, we usually do it co-ed, although we have one week that is uh, strictly just for boys now that we added a couple years ago. And so that's been sort of the bulk of my basketball business. Uh, per se. And then I've added some other pieces to it along the way with some more training and other different things. And then about a year and a half ago, I believe it was last June of 2018, started doing a podcast, which is something that I've kind of had on my list to do for a couple of years, just because I spend a lot of time commuting to my quote, real job as a teacher. So I spent a lot of time listening to podcasts. So I always thought, hey, that'd be something that I'd like to start and kept putting it at the top of my to-do list. Wouldn't do it. You know, I cross it off and then I come back and rewrite it the next week and, and keep right. adding. And eventually, eventually we got around to getting it started. And we were fortunate right from the beginning to get connected to some really good guests. Um, Greg White from USA Basketball and Alan Stein, who uh, has a big internet presence. He's now into corporate speaking, but at the time he was uh, a basketball athletic performance coach. And those two guys both opened up their networks uh, along with my own network. And through those three networks, we were able to really – grow the podcast and get some great people involved in it. So it's been, it's been quite a journey. I've had, a, I've had a great time doing the things that I do with basketball. And ultimately the goal is one, to have a positive impact on kids using the game of basketball. And then two, from the podcast standpoint, I think we're really looking to impact coaches and players and parents to try to make their basketball experience better and really try to grow the game and help it, help it improve. So that's, that's kind of my backstory. Okay. Well, touch on a couple of things you said um, as a former coach and a former camper and all that. Um, and, and like you said, a, a few years ago was the last time I was at camp um, as a player uh, several few years ago. Uh, <laughs> I know when you get together with coaches and teachers, and this is something my experience was that even if you didn't know them and you start sitting around talking about basketball, you're talking about hoop heads. It, it just, what you thought was going to be a 30 second conversation ends up being like three hours. Absolutely. And that is the, the joy, I think, of – I don't know if it works with all other sports, but I know when you're talking basketball, you can talk basketball with someone that has some knowledge about basketball for days. And, and so from the podcast point of view, I can see how exciting that is. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I'll tell you what, we, we actually started the show. So it's changed. The original format or the original idea that we had morphed very quickly so when we started the podcast we really thought my partner and I and part of the problem with me getting it started was I tried a couple times to do it by myself or it was just going to be me talking about a youth basketball topic right. so I thought I'll do a 10 to 15 minute episode just me talking about something and I found it for me it wasn't as fun as having a conversation and I didn't enjoy it. like I thought boy I'm really going to enjoy podcasting and when I did it myself and it was just me talking, I didn't enjoy it very much. Right. So that was my first attempt. And so then I started looking around for, all right, who can I get to be a partner, to be a co-host, somebody that I can talk basketball with? 
And so I eventually found it in a friend of mine who actually had come to my basketball camp when he was younger. So he's probably about I don't know, 17 or 18 years younger than me, somewhere in there. And so he and I have known each other for a long, long time. And then he's worked at my basketball camps in addition to having gone to them. And he had some knowledge of how to kind of get things set up on the tech side of it. So he ended up being a really good partner. So the original idea was for he and I to talk about youth basketball parenting issues and just kind of go through and talk and he and I having conversations about different topics. Like for example, one of our topics was why you shouldn't coach your kids from the stands. Just let the coach, just let the coach coach and have the parents be quiet. So we would spend anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes, depending on the topic, talking about it. And like you said, it was very easy. What you would think would be a five or 10 minute topic very easily can turn into something much longer. But then, as I said earlier, what had ended up happening is we got connected to some really good people to do some interviews. And we kind of had it in the back of our mind that maybe we were going to interview high school basketball coaches here in the Cleveland area, somewhere down the road. That was kind of the plan. And we had to figure out the technology of how we we're going to do kind of what you and I are doing here. Right whether it was Zoom or we end up using Skype with the audio, but we had to figure out the process, just like I'm sure you did, how to make it all work and fit together. And I got a chance to get connected to Alan Stein through kind of a long story of me reaching out to him to see if he would write something for my blog. And he wrote back no, because he was changing from kind of the basketball performance space into the corporate speaking space. And so I happened to have a friend who was putting together conferences where he actually brought in corporate speakers and CEOs and people for these events. So I ended up connecting Alan to my friend. And when I did that, then Alan and I sort of built a relationship. And then he came on the show, opened up his network. The week after we had Alan on the show, I went to a USA basketball coaching clinic. I met a couple other guys there, Greg White, Lindsey Huddleston, who came on the show. And those guys were just tremendous to me, opened up their networks. And what had been a show of Jason and I talking about youth parenting issues suddenly became Boom. an interview suddenly it became an interview show right. and like you said one of the things that's been very very fun is to be able to have those basketball conversations where I used to coach in, the, in high school I was a varsity assistant coach for 13 or 14 years at the beginning of my career and I've been out of that space for probably about 10 but one of the things that I always tell people before I started the podcast that I really missed was the conversations in the coach's office after practice, right. after games. Right. Those are the things that I missed. And so this podcast has really done a great job of replacing that basketball talk and that opportunity to be able to talk to great people. And so, yeah, we find that uh, we'll do a lot of shows. Where we'll, we'll talk to a guy for an hour and a half and I won't even look at the clock once. And all of a sudden I'm like, yeah, I think we better start wrapping this yeah. up. We've been talking for, <laughs> we've been talking for 90 minutes. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it goes – you can, you can really get it going with basketball and uh, it's people, people love it. People are willing to talk. And what I've found is that even more so I think today than it's ever been coaches are much more open and willing to share what they do, how they do it. I think there's a collective mentality amongst basketball coaches of, of trying to grow the game and make it better for everybody. And that's really what we found and what's been exciting and fun about it. Uh, you know, I, I miss the, you know, you go to a shootout, and someone's got to grab you and say, time to get back on the bus, coach. Like, oh, I didn't realize it. You know, you didn't, talk, <laughs> you didn't even know. You said, what was that wrinkle you ran there? What was that out of bounds play? You know, and you see, it, next thing you know, it's 40 minutes later. Yeah, you know, those are great things, you know. Um, yeah, and, share. Coaches love to share. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's you're never going to get exactly what they get, but you kind of get a little wrinkle of what they talked about, and then you kind of can build on that. No one's ever running the exact same thing. But you're running something that someone else has done before. Yeah. For yeah, sure. Nobody's cool. reinventing that. Everybody's right. reinventing. Nobody's reinventing that wheel. I, I had a, a, a press break that people, that's really great. Like, uh, I saw that from somebody 20 years ago. <laughs> I just tweaked it a little bit. So I know what you mean. Um, now, you mentioned the campers and, and, and a, 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 a former camper that now that you're an associate with. Um, that's kind of the fun of it as well. You know, you, you see these kids grow up coming in as elementary students, and now they come out as grown men, and now they're real, living actual lives. And they may not make the NBA, but what you do shapes who they become. And kind of, in essence, you've created your own friend. Yeah, I think that the, what's really exciting for me is that 
one, you get to have an impact on those kids when they're young. And I'm also in my home community where I grew up and I did move away for a little while, but now I'm back living in my same community. So I see those kids not only during camp, but I'll see them at the grocery store. I'll see them out or I'll see them at other sporting events, whatever. So it gives me that type of connection that allows you to be able to have that kind of impact like you're describing. And then one of the nice things that I've always been able to do with camp is if you come to any session of one of our Head Start basketball camps, what you find is that a lot of the staff members, especially ones who are high school and college age coaches, those are kids who have, who have previously come to camp or worked with me. So they already know what the experience is like. You hope that the reason why they come back is because it was a positive experience right. for them when they were a camper, and then they want to give back and be able to do the same thing. So that's one of the things that gives me more pride, more, more pleasure than anything else is the fact that you've created something that now has not just impacted those kids in the moment, but 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, 30 years down the road, when those kids think back to the experience that they had in camp or the relationship they had with you, it's still having an impact on them years and years later. And to me, that's something that I don't know if I thought about that as much when I was younger, but for sure, as I've gotten older, that's become more and more and more important to me is how am I using the game of basketball to impact the players, the kids, the coaches that I'm coming in contact with so that not only am I directly impacting them in the moment, whether that's through a game and trying to win or that's through camp and trying to give them a great experience, it's five years from now, 10 years from now, are they going to remember those things? And is it going to make them a better person? Because ultimately, you know, you just said it. Most of them aren't going to make the NBA. And the odds of you as a basketball coach, trainer, camp, organizer, having a kid that gets to the NBA is pretty small. Right. So what you want to do is be able to make sure that you're having a positive impact so that those kids, regardless of what they end up doing, whether they end up staying in the game of basketball in some capacity or they end up being doctors or lawyers or, you know, mothers, fathers, you want them to be impacted by what you did so that they can have a better quality of life. And, and when they come back to you, whether that's coming back to look for an opportunity to coach and work at the camp or whether that's just a phone call, there's nothing better as a coach than hearing a voice on the other end of the phone line 10 years down the road. Hey, coach, I just wanted to tell you that this is what happened. Or, hey, coach, I'm getting married. I want you to be at the wedding. There's nothing better than that because you know that you've had an impact on on a kid that that's reaching back out to you like that i i had the experience when i ran into the mother of one of the kids from camp that never actually got to play for me uh various different things happened and that was the that was hey coach hmm? uh, who said that and, <laughs> oh, i just want to thank you for you know what you did with my son like uh i don't remember actually ever coaching him well, you had him and you gave him the, the impetus to get moving towards something. And he he's become a very solid, upstanding young man. You know, uh, I don't really think I did anything, but how you go about your business is how you go about your business. And you do do something, even though you don't realize you do something at the time. So that's, it's a great thing. Yeah. I think that's a huge point that whenever we're talking to coaches and thinking about who my audience is for the podcast, that's a point that I always try to bring out. And I think as a teacher, you try to remember this too. And even as a parent, that a lot of times the things that we say or the things that we do, the things that we model, we don't even realize that those things are sticking with kids. Like you said, you might have a kid that comes back to you. And I've had this happen to me where a kid comes back and says, hey, coach, do you remember when you said such and such? And I'm like, no, I have no recollection <laughs> of saying that. And yet, here's something that I said 10 years ago that a kid remembers that they're still thinking about. And those are the kinds of things that I think sometimes as coaches, teachers, parents, we take for granted the power of our words to have an impact because there might be things that we, that we plan or that we think about, boy, I know this is going to be impactful and this little talk that I'm going to give, or this action is going to really be important. But a lot of times it's the little things, it's the arm around a kid's shoulder as you're coming off the floor, or it's a, right you know, a little prize that you gave them after they won a contest. Those are the things that kids remember that continue to have an impact that you as the adult, as the coach 
probably tend to forget. And I think that's something that we all have to remember as adults that everything we do and say, kids are watching and listening and remembering. And, and that's important for us to remember because our impact carries on long, be, long past the moment that those kids are in front of us. And they soak up everything that you do. Even if you don't think that they're doing it, they soak up everything that you do. So if you're giving them positive information and positive feedback, they'll accept that. If you're giving them negative information and negative feedback, they'll accept that as well. And that's how they, they model themselves. Now, not to say we're the only role models that they have, but they'll take that as a conglomeration of what they see and go, okay, this person who I think is very important, this is how he projects himself and how he conducts himself. And they kind of tend to follow that. So, and like you said, even though you don't realize it's happening, it's happening. And I think that's a great thing. That's the, the, like I said, the things I miss about coaching, those, those little interactions that you don't even really recognize are happening at the time until you go, oh, that was, like you said, hey, coach, do you remember that time? Like, that time on the bus when we, huh? Oh, yeah. We were talking about, you know, old rock music or something like that. Yeah. Well, it got me into music and now I'm in a band like, Really? Yeah. So that's really cool. Um, now talk to me a little bit about how you conduct the camp. Uh, and we talked uh, previously before we got involved here of coming from a local one school camp as opposed to getting people from multiple communities and whatnot. How, how, do, how does that work? That's a great question. So obviously, like I said, I started out just in my home community. Uh, the first place that I spread out to was the community where I teach. Uh, so that was the next step. And obviously I had a built-in audience there because I had students that I could promote and market it to. And then the next step is how do you take it to a community where you don't have the same level of direct personal involvement? And so that's sort of like you and I connecting here. Uh, I equate it to the miracle of the internet and being able to reach out to people in that way. And so I actually, it's kind of funny, the first website that, I ever put up for the camp was, I think, it, I think I put it up in maybe, I want to say maybe 1998 and I built it with Microsoft publisher. Right. And so, so, I mean, it was, I mean, you look at it now, what that was compared to what we have today. And it was, I mean, it was archaic and terrible and whatever, but it was the first time that somebody from somewhere else or even somebody from your home community could find it on the computer and then they would have to go on and, I didn't have online registration or anything like that. It was just, they would go on, it was a static page and they could print the registration form. And then my address was at the bottom and they'd print the form, fill it out and then send it to me in the mail. And so that was the first real attempt to start going and, and, and expanding it. And when I really decided that I was gonna expand it in a greater fashion, and then I had to go back and redo the website and make sure that the website was on point so it had all the things that it needed to have information about me and the camps and what we do and how we do it and then you had to have a good registration flow so that people weren't on your site looking at it and it's not working and they're having trouble registering all that kind of stuff so what i found is is that if you go in and you can get it started in the first year and you can get 25 or 30 kids that first year through the internet and maybe through a connection or two you have in the community that then your best advertising becomes word of mouth and parents talking about, Hey, we went to this camp. It was a great experience for our kids. And if you're looking for something to do basketball wise, this is a great place. You know, this is a great place to do it. This is a great group to be able to go and attend their camp because of all the things that they do that, that make it so positive. And so it's, it's always a challenge. I mean, I've gone to communities in the past where, it hasn't worked where we haven't been able to get that first year going simply because we just don't have the presence. And then you back off and you look for another community where maybe it's going to be, you know, where you're going to do better. And so I've been fortunate in that I've found some good communities outside of my home, uh, you know, outside of my home suburb of Cleveland here. And as a result, we've been able to grow the camp. And this year, I think we had 10 or 11 sessions of camp over the course of the summer. And, what it's enabled me to do is what I talked about before, which is grow your influence and be able to have an impact on more kids. And obviously it's good from a business standpoint too, but ultimately what you're trying to do is bring what you feel is a quality camp that teaches the game the right way, that teaches the values of sportsmanship, that uses the game to teach those life lessons 
you're bringing that to more kids. Because a lot of times, especially in today's world, basketball has become focused on just the elite player and everything is geared towards being elite and being AAU and getting exposure. And so there's very few, I look at my camp as kind of an old school camp where you come in and, you know, we do some fundamental work for the first half of the camp. And then the second half of the day, we're doing some games and we're doing some contests, but it's focused on teaching and it's focused on learning the game and, and making sure that it's fun for the kids. If you're a, if you're a third grader and you're just kind of getting into the game of basketball, you want to go to a camp environment where it's fun. And right. I think when you make it fun and you're teaching it the right way and people come in and they see it's organized and they see that, you know, you've got, you know, like my camps that I have here in my hometown of Strongsville, I'll have anywhere from 80 to a hundred kids at a camp. Well, if you're a parent and you come in and you see that those 80 to a hundred kids are organized into groups or teams and, there's plenty of coaches and the coach to camper ratio is where it should be. And you're moving them from space to space and you have right. it planned out. People know, people recognize that because we all know there's lots of programs out there that because there's just a proliferation, again, across all sports, that not all programs are organized and, and done the way that they should be. And so parents, I think, recognize very quickly if you're a good place to spend their money and if their kid is enjoying themselves and getting something out of it. And so when you do things correct, I think that people find you because they're looking for somebody who's doing things the right way and making sure that their kid is having a good experience. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the blueprint. Well, you're, you're trying to get it to where you have like 10, 12 kids to a station. You know, you don't want to, you have 45 kids sitting around and only the elite kid can shine. Yeah. I understand that completely. Now, when you, you said it's an old school camp, um, kind of compare the, the skills that you're teaching now or the way you're teaching now, as opposed to 27 years ago? That's a great question. So I think with, within the camp framework, the camp framework itself, the way it's set up is probably very little change in terms of we'll do an hour and a half of station work where you're working with each, each individual coach. And then we go and we do our games and our contests. But as far as the skill and how we're teaching it, uh, we definitely do more game-based type activities as opposed to just putting kids in in lines and having them do a repetitive skill right. um you know there's certainly a, a need for that at the younger ages i think the older kids get i think the more you want to get them into game-based drills and play i think for younger kids there's still a need for that repetition as as they're learning the game but certainly what we've done and what we've tried to do within our stations has changed as i've gone out and observed other camps as I've watched other coaches, I think one of the big things that always comes across with the guests that we have on our Hoop Heads podcast is the number of coaches who talk about how important it is to continue to learn the game and understand that I don't know everything about it. And there's somebody out there, just like you mentioned earlier, there's somebody out there that's doing something slightly different or slightly better or just in a way that you hadn't thought of. And so that's one of the things that I try to do is anywhere – that I go, whether it's another camp, whether it's a clinic, whether it's just listening to people talk on the podcast, I try to take ideas, write them down in a notebook, and then go ahead and go back and apply those ideas to the camp. So I would say for sure there's been changes over the years in terms of how we've gone about teaching the skills, but the core of, of what we are and what we've been is, is the same. I, I like to give a little speech at the beginning of camp where I talk about three things I tell the kids this, and I tell the parents this, that the three goals that we have are, one, we want you to have fun. So if the camp's not fun, why would you come? Well, you're right. if, you're, if, if you're an elementary school kid and you're involved in whatever sport it is or whatever activity it is and it's not fun, then why would you keep coming back? So number one, it has to be fun. Number two, you're going to learn something about basketball. And that may be for a kid who's six, they may only learn – one thing, maybe it'll be the first time they ever dribble the ball with their left hand or they learn how to lift up the correct knee on a layup. And so maybe it's only one or two things. And then if it's a little bit older kid who's maybe more advanced, maybe we're going to be able to teach them some, you know, game specific things that they can use while they're playing three on three. And we want them to learn something. And then number three is we want to inspire you so that you want to play more basketball. So even it's camp ends and you're going to go out and you're going to take some shots on your driveway for 15 minutes for the next week. Or maybe it takes a kid who had never played basketball and now the next year they want to join a team. Or maybe it's a kid who's already been serious 
and they decide, hey, I'm going to take it up one more level. And so those are the three things. Have fun, learn something, inspire you to play more. And I think if you can do that, and that's really what we try to do, then we've done something positive for those kids who have come to camp. That's, that's great. That's great. And that, those are the things that, that I remember getting from camp. That, you know, when I got home from camp, I'm in the driveway playing. My parents yeah. like, you just got home. All right. There's so much they taught me I can do now. Yeah. Isn't, that the, isn't that the truth? There's nothing yeah. better. I think that, that that's a ringing endorsement of any camp that a kid goes to when they come home and they want to do more of it. There's, there's no better endorsement than that. Well, and, and you mentioned that, that the way that you keep involved with them, and I'll tell you a quick little story. My, I went to a camp, I think I was a freshman, before my freshman year, and we all went to the same camp. Before my uh, sophomore year, actually, we all went to, you know, the whole team went to the same camp, and we all had different coaches, different people that we had never come across before. Well, you fast forward 20-some, 30-some years later, and I'm applying for a job at the, actually, my rival high school where I went to, where I was at. And the outgoing AD was my coach from that camp. So, you know, and I still happen to have the little report card that they gave us at the end of that camp. So that was part of my resume. And, and at the bottom, I said, and now I can go to my left. You know, that kind of <laughs> And then the awesome. good thing about that is he was also the tennis coach, and I ended up becoming his assistant tennis coach. And then we flipped jobs, so he was my assistant a couple of years later. And it was like, wow, that, that stuck with me. And the things, the skills that he taught us and the way he taught us at that camp stuck with me for, you know, 30-some years later. And now I'm coaching with him using those same skills. And it was, it's amazing how that just kind of keeps together. Of course, we butted heads because I thought I knew more than he did, even though I knew <laughs> it. Um, when, you, when you get involved with the, the nuts and bolts of this and you're really saying, okay, we set up the camp, we've got everybody here now. You mentioned the first thing that you say. What's the first thing that you do? What's the first drill? Excellent. So I, I can I can answer this question. This is an easy one. So okay. the first thing that we do is we get done checking in the last camper. And so as we're checking in, you have, let's just throw a round number out there. Let's say you have 100 kids in the gym and all the balls and everybody's shooting and it's chaos. And so you've got 50 sets of parents that are standing around on the side going, oh my gosh, what did I just bring my kid into? Right. And it's crazy. And so the first thing that we do is I'll blow the whistle and kids will sort of stop, you know, but they're still dribbling. A couple of kids will take a shot after the whistle and they start kind of walking towards you and some of them are still talking. And so I usually have to blow the whistle a second time and you'll get them quiet. And I'll say, okay, the first thing that we're going to learn is we're going to get into triple threat position. And so then I'll say, okay, what is triple threat position? And of course, there'll be some kids that know, some kids that don't know, but a bunch of hands will shoot up. And so I'll say, okay, give me one of the things. And, you know, a coach will go through and say, I can pass, I can dribble, I can shoot. So once we answer that question, then I'll say, okay, when you hear the whistle, we're going to freeze and we're going to get into triple threat. And there's two reasons why we're going to do that. One is it's an important thing for you to understand playing the game of basketball. So later when we play our games or we're in our stations and the coach says, get into triple threat or you catch the ball in a game, we want you to get into that triple threat position. So it's important for you to learn that just from a basketball standpoint. And then number two, the second, and maybe more important reason, you know, as it relates to camp is you're going to freeze. So you're going to freeze. If you just shot your basketball and it's rolling away from you, you're going to let it roll and you're going to freeze and pretend like you have a ball. And if you have a ball in your hand, you're going to immediately freeze into that triple threat and you're not going to say anything. You're not going to do anything. And then I'll say, okay, we're going to practice this. Everybody go back to your basket and do what you were just doing, which is firing up shots and running around and being loud and whatever. And so then I'll blow that whistle. And right after that, it's immediate silence. Right. And so now you're looking around and there's a whole set of parents who 30 seconds earlier right. were wondering, boy, what did I just drop my, what did I just pay my money for, for this camp? It's chaos. And now all of a sudden they see, that it's going to be organized. And when you do that on day one or you do it later in the day or you do it on day two or three and a parent walks in and you blow that whistle and immediately those kids now are, boom, they're right on point uh, getting into triple threat. So that's the very, very first thing that we do. And I, I have to give credit where credit is due. I, I stole that idea, again, just like we talked about a minute ago, uh, from the University of Michigan. So I worked at the University of Michigan, Michigan's basketball camp uh, between, I believe it was between my freshman and sophomore year when the Fab Five was there. 
And an assistant coach who had been with me at Kent State, Jay Smith, was uh, left Kent after my freshman year, went to the University of Michigan. And he was in charge and helped run the camps, uh, the summer camps at University of Michigan. So they would do that same thing, but they do it on a much greater scale. They might have had 400 or 450 kids. Right. And then they added one thing that as an Ohio guy, I never added it to my mix, but they would, <laughs> they would then, they would then sing the Michigan fight song oh. after, they would get in, after they would get into triple threat. So it was, even as an Ohio guy, they would sing hail to the victors, uh, which was pretty impressive for 450 kids to all learn the fight song and be singing it. And so that was kind of neat. I never added that to my camps, but, uh, <laughs> but that's where I got the idea. So that was something that, has worked for me it's, it's continued to work for 27 years and even though it's not it's not a drill and it doesn't directly answer your question that's the first thing that we do no. every year because that sets the tone for how the rest of the camp's going to go and it's how we keep everything organized well it, it actually it, it answers the question exactly because my thing was you know in, in a, the same kind of things like okay when i talk you don't and then when you talk i listen you know, so we're all going to get our chance to respond. Uh, but when the coaches are speaking, everyone's quiet. And, and you would think that would be a hard thing to get them to do. Because they're, like you said, there's out running around. But when you actually follow it up with something that they want to hear, like, we're going to have fun, we're going to do this, we're going to enjoy ourselves. Now you've got their attention. So from that point on, if you want, and the parents love it too, because they don't have that ability at home. When I right, think, exactly. Good, yep. but they don't, you know. And they, they stop and go, okay, coach, what are we going to do now? He said, now it's time to go and you give them something fun to do. You know, and they go, oh, okay. Let's see if you can shoot 10 shots and beat me in something. Really? I called it beat the coach. And, you know, sometimes it did, sometimes it didn't, you know. Sometimes I might miss a shot or two on purpose just to see what would happen. Right. And they're like, I beat the coach, I beat the coach. Okay, and they're, they're <laughs> excited. So, And that, that level of excitement – like I said, that carries on and carries over for, for decades. It's, it's really amazing. So that, that to me is you've got it right. You've got it right on the nose that, you know, you, you, you combine the learning and the development with enjoying yourself. And triple threat position, hey, you've got to be in triple threat position. You, you've got to know that. You know, those are things that you have to know. And now they know it. You won't ever have to go back to them 10 years later and go, you got the ball ripped from you. Why? You know, that's something I've been, doing that, I've been doing that for six years at Ed Star basketball camp. Right. Every, day, every time that whistle blows, I got to get in triple threat. And I forgot to, how did you forget to do it? And <laughs> one thing I've noticed, and correct me if I'm wrong, one thing I've noticed in watching people that haven't, like you said, you've got the elite camps that are more play camps and there are teach camps or learn camps, is that, you know, this is a generalization, but I've seen that those basic fundamental fundamentals are not either being taught or being enforced. Yeah, I think there's definitely been – it's it's tough. I think when, kids at younger ages today, they're playing more than they ever have. So when you were seven, eight, nine years old, you weren't playing anywhere near the number of games 20 or 30 years ago that kids today are playing. And so there's pluses and minuses to that. Um, you know, I mean, again, I don't want to sound like the old get-off-my-lawn type guy, right. but I like, I like the system that I grew up in where I was playing with my friends on the driveway and then eventually – I was playing on the playgrounds and playing against people of all different ages. And there, rather than playing with a ref and against my right. own age group and with a coach and my parents in the stands, I like the system that I grew up, you know, playing under. But at the same time, I do think that there's a lack of, of learning those basic fundamentals early because kids spend so much time playing. And I think part of that problem is part of that problem is coach education too, because in a lot of cases, what we have at the younger levels who's coaching those eight-year-olds, those seven-year-olds, right. those nine-year-olds. More often than not, it's a father. And sometimes the fathers know a lot. Sometimes they know very little. And obviously, every organization out there needs at some point volunteer coaches to help them. But what I think we should do a better job of is offering them coach education and right. being able to show them, hey, here's the things that you should be teaching. I know USA Basketball – has their standards that they put out, that they do a really great job. So if you are a volunteer basketball coach out there at any level, if you go to the USA Basketball website and find those USA Basketball Youth Guidelines, those are tremendous for learning 
what you should be teaching at what age. But too often, what we do is our practice involved coach standing on the side, we roll the ball out, the kids play, that's the practice. Maybe the coach says a couple things, or maybe they're just talking to their assistant while they're standing there. And then you go play some games on the weekend with your uniform. And that is a lot of times what you see. And so, and it's not that those coaches aren't doing a good job or don't want to be the best coaches that they can be. A lot of times they just don't, they just don't know. Like if I was put out on a soccer field, I don't know a lot about soccer. And if I wasn't motivated to go and learn some drills and learn how to do things better for my particular age group, I wouldn't be a very good soccer coach. So I think that coach education piece is one of the things that, as I look at what can we do to improve the basketball landscape here in the United States, I think coach education is a huge piece of how we can make it better. And, and one of the things you're talking about is not wanting to be that get off my lawn guy, which I am one of those guys, unfortunately, <laughs> um, is that, and, and, and you know how this works as well. It, it, as a teacher, you know, if you have a test today, it's kind of hard to teach them what's on the test today because you, you're now in test mode. You're not in learning mode, you're in test mode. So now you're regurgitating instead of actually learning. So you right. needed to learn the information two weeks ago. Now when you take the test today, you take the test. Well, if every time you're involved in basketball is a game and it's you've got the referees and keeping score, I can't change your shot today because I can't work on the nuances of how do you get in position? How do you front this person? How do I do that? Because you're playing today. I don't want you thinking about all that or you're not capable of thinking about all that because now you're playing. And you know, when you're coaching in a game, you're sometimes giving instruction, but you're really just reiterating what you've talked about throughout the course of the, the week or the month or, or whatever. Say so now, remember when he's trying to get here, you want to get this leg up or this arm there, but you're not teaching them something new. I've learned that the hard way, trying to put it in an out-of-bounds play that I made up on the spot, <laughs> and everyone went four different directions. Like, yeah. well, it was pretty simple. We never run it before. Well, you're supposed to go from there to there, but I've never done it before. You can't teach on the fly like that. So that's what I see happening in, in these play as opposed to learn camps. And then, unfortunately, as you said with the elite players, that's all they're involved in. So are they learning how to play? When do they get taught? And I agree with you. It's something, it has something to do with the coaches, but I think it also has something to do with when do we teach them? And, yep. and I, know I agree. Ohio is different than it is. I'm out in the West now where it's, you know, it's open season. You can transfer from here to there or whatever, which I find very, very disheartening. But it's – you don't even get that downtime to learn from a camp or from an off-season program or open gym or anything like that because you're – moving along with playing again. If I don't get playing time, I transfer someplace else. Wow. That's kind of tough. So yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I agree with you. I think there's a lot to unpack there. And what you said, one is the ratio of games to practices. I know that almost every coach we talk to from the high school level, college level, they all talk about we need to be spending more time in practice and less time playing games. And I think you made the best point about it because one of the trends is, in basketball today and coaching is to do more games based coaching where I'm doing a drill and the, the drill is based on, it looks more like a game. It has an offense and a defense right. and I'm still teaching a skill within that drill, as opposed to just me going against a cone or me just repetitively shooting. But there's a difference between, as you described, doing those things in practice where the scoreboard's not on, there aren't any fans watching you. So then I can make the corrections that I need to make, whether that's if you're talking about, a seven-year-old that may be again which foot do I jump off on a layup or yeah. you know what how do I make this particular pass or how do I set a screen and then if you're talking about uh, an elite high school player now you're talking about a whole different set of skills that they might be learning within their practice but still if I'm in a game and I'm constantly being evaluated whether that's by just my parents my coach or in the case of players who have aspirations of playing in college, I might be playing in front of some scouts. Well, I'm going to revert back to what I already do well. Right. I'm not going to be working on my weaknesses. Whereas, again, we talked about it a few minutes ago, where if you were playing on your driveway or you're at the playground, I know for myself, when I would play in a game with maybe players who weren't as good as me, I would sometimes just say, okay, this game, I'm only going to dribble with my left hand. Right. Or right. 
this game, I'm only going to work on my passing. Well, you don't have the opportunity to do that when the lights are on and there's a referee and your mom's in the stands. Those opportunities go away. So I think that's one piece of it is just that we play, we play too many, we play too many games and we need to spend more time in training practice environments where we can learn and do those new things. And I think that's a big thing that could be improved when it comes to the game of basketball for sure. Well, you know, I, when uh, the Ohio High School Athletic Association went from 20 games to 22 games in high school, and everyone was – well, not everyone, a lot of people were excited. I'm like, no, that's not good because that's one more game that we don't have a chance we, – we've got a scout for, we've got a game plan for, two more games, I'm sorry. And then what happens when – and you know, being where you're from, what happens the weather kicks in, and now you've got to mess up your schedule because now you've got three games in four days or – however it works out, well, you're not able to have a practice to learn anything because now you're practicing for the game plan. Right. And you're game planning for two, three, four games in a row, unless you're going to practice on Sunday at 9 o'clock. You know, you've got a lot of other things you've got to put together. That essentially got rid of three weeks of practice. And so you're as good as you're going to get. It's the team that was able to practice more that improved more. And, you know, the team at the beginning of the season that had bigger studs, they were able to do okay, but the team was able to practice more, was able to eclipse them as you went through the season because they had a chance to actually learn the things they needed, the skills they need to learn to get through the season. Now, as, as that goes to camp, it's kind of the same thing. Like you said, you have a kid that goes to camp that wants to play, 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 and we've all witnessed that. Oh, this is boring. Well, sometimes it's going to be boring. Sorry about that. Sometimes you have to learn a few things in order to get better because you come back to camp the next year, and the kid that learned those things is now better than you. What yeah, more there's, that, you do? there's that saying out there that if you're going to be great, you got to fall in love with the boredom because right. repetition is really what makes you who you are. And the greatest players, you know, that have ever played, they talk about how important their practice routine was and just, you know, over and over and focusing in on those minute little details. And obviously we don't expect an eight year old to, perform the same way Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant did in terms of their practice habits and the way they do things. But the lesson there is, is that repetition, it's not a punishment. Repetition is something that is necessary in order for you to be successful. And if all you're doing is playing and you're never putting in the time to get those reps, whether that's in a team practice in a high school setting, or whether that's just you in a gym somewhere by yourself working on your game, you're never going to be as good as you can be when all you do is play and that's the challenge that's out there and the system is set up where it benefits adults in a lot of cases uh, to play more games tournament organizers aau clubs you know that kind of thing they make money when somebody plays and they don't make as much money when somebody practices and so that's the challenge that's out there again helping people to understand whether that's coaches whether that's parents whether that's players helping people to understand what it really should be all about and what it takes to a be successful and then b understanding why it is that you play because everybody has different goals for why they play the game some kids you know don't have any aspirations of being a high school star basketball player or getting a college scholarship they just want to play with their friends and a lot of times it's difficult for those kids to find those places to be able to play because a lot of what we do now is geared towards the more serious player, even though I would make the argument and I made it before I had kids and I continue to make it now that my kids are, uh, you know, I have a 10th grader an eighth grader and a fourth grader. And there's, there's very few kids who want to practice anything four or five days a week for a couple hours a day. I mean, there are some, but for the most part, kids want to do different things. They want to be trying this and going there and doing that. And so I think, sometimes the system that we have now in youth sports kind of we force kids into this specialization channel it's not just basketball it's every sport and we channel them you know into that and then you see okay I'm eight or nine years old and I'm playing soccer five you know practicing soccer four nights a week and then I've got a tournament every weekend and now I'm 13 years old and I hate soccer because I never see soccer again right time it's crazy oh I've I've that's that's a shame of it yeah, I've seen that happen any number of times. Like, he was really good when he was nine. He never wants to see it again. Never wants yeah. to even watch it on TV, right? Well, I think you, we've, we've gone to a point where it kind of makes sense. that I See if this makes sense. 
we are the ones, all of us coaches and, and trainers and everybody, we're the ones that set the tone. If, a, if you get a third grader and you show them the right way, they'll tend to follow that right way. So if we give them that idea of this is the right way of doing things, or they follow the wrong way as well, I guess is another way of putting it. But what we put out there for them, they'll soak it up. So if we say, okay, you have half an hour. These are the drills you should do or whatever, you, however you want to put it. This will help you get better and, and get more enjoyment out of the game. Now, it may not be fun today. It may not be fun tomorrow. But I guarantee you it's going to be start to be fun once you start seeing these things work in your games on the weekend. You know, oh, that, so it builds upon itself. Instead of just caving in and going, just roll the balls out there and let them go. And I think that, yeah. it's, no, no pun intended, we've dropped the ball on that. And I like what you're talking about and the way your camps are running. It's like, okay, we're going to make it fun, but we're also going to teach you something. You're, you're going to learn something while you're here. So I really appreciate it. That's, that's kind of when, I, when I, we came across each other on LinkedIn and then I saw – your website, I'm like, yeah, this is somebody I want to talk to because you, you get it. And I really appreciate that. And that's kind of the, the message we're trying to send here. It's like, let's get people to understand because it's possible that we may reach that AAU coach or that AAU director or whomever to say, maybe we can, like you said, they, they have to make money to, to sustain the programs. I get that. But maybe we can get it to the point where we say, we're diluting the product. Let's get the product better. Yeah, I think if you can have an impact, like I said, in educating coaches and educating, you know, organizers of teams and in organizations, I think you're going to end up with a lot better product ultimately for the kids, which that should always be the focus is what's best for those kids and not what's best for the adult in right. that particular situation. And, and I go back to what I said before, you want them to have fun, you want them to learn something, you want to inspire them to continue to be involved in the game because you hope when they're 30, 40, 50 years old that maybe they're still playing or maybe they're coaching or maybe they've picked up a, a whistle and now they're refereeing or maybe they've gotten involved in the business side of sports or whatever. Those are the kind of things that you want to have an impact with kids long term so that what you've done as a coach, whether it's through your camps or whether it's through coaching them on a team, you want to have that long term impact that we talked about earlier. Well, one, one phrase that I've always used, which is, it's a contradiction, but basketball is an egoless game for an egotistical person. That you have to believe that you can do the best you can by doing the best for everybody else. So when, like you said, when the parent or the coach says, we're going to have three hour practices, six days a week, and then we're going to practice for an hour and a half on Sunday. It's like, that's not going to work because you have people with lives now, you may be a dedicated coach that wants to get things done, but they, have, they might want to be in the band. They might want to be in the Cub Scouts. They might, there's a lot of things that they want to be able to do that helps them grow as people. And unless you have the next NBA superstar, where are they going to be in another five years? Like you said, they may never want to touch a basketball again with all of that. So you have to be ego-driven as a coach or as a teacher, but also ego-driven enough to know that you've got to give more. Yeah, it has to be balanced. And I think one of the things that we've talked to a bunch of different coaches on our podcast about is the, the idea that whatever decisions are made about what the kid is participating in, and I'm, I'm speaking more here maybe from a high school perspective of the kid being able to make their own decisions at a younger age. You know, obviously the parents are going to be more involved in the decision-making process, but you want the decision to play multiple sports or play one sport to be directed by the kid and not by the adults that are involved. So if I'm a kid and I'm a basketball player, but I also want to run cross country, I shouldn't have the basketball coach coming to me and saying, if you play cross country, you're not going to make my basketball team. Right. You know, it's one thing if I'm a basketball kid and I decide on my own that I'm not going to do any other sports, I'm only going to play basketball. Terrific. As a basketball coach, selfishly, I'm excited when a kid comes to me and tells me that because I want him around doing the right. things that, that we're going to be doing. But, the problem that I always have is when the adult coach goes and dictates to a kid, hey, if you want to be part of our program, then you need to be doing these things related to my program right. at the expense of you participating in something else. And again, the odds are so stacked against a kid ever being able to make a living as a professional athlete. And even if they do, what's wrong with being a well-rounded person as, as, a, as a professional athlete? So the best of the best are going to get there because – 
they want it, not because of what some adult, whether it's their parent or their coach, said to them or forced them to do. The, the best of the best get there because, because they're driven and they want it internally. It's an intrinsic motivation as opposed to extrinsic. And, and, you, and you, you said you use the right terminology there. You have to come to be in my program. Well, it's not my program. It's our program. You know, I was an athletic director. It wasn't my athletic department. It was our athletic department. You know, it's kind of hard to do it that way and, and to say, you know, well, you need to be part of my soccer team. No, it's not mine. It's yours. I'm part of it. It's ours. And, and again, that's an ego-driven person that has to be not egotistical. Because sure. you have to understand, I mean, if, if say, let's use the high school example again. Say you're a great high school coach, but you have no one coaching or participating in the lower levels. Well, in another five years, you're not going to be a great high school coach. You know, that, let's face it, you're not going to, if you don't have people that are skilled and involved in what your program does and what our philosophy is, well, you can only be as good as the people that are surrounding you and the people that lead them to you. So unless you're just going to get a bunch of transfers to come in and play and then go, you know, so that's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a tough way to go. But again, talking about where you're developing kids from your camp and what you're doing, I, like I said, I, I see it as a lot of positives. And I, not only the positives, but it's because, as you said, they're not just going to become great basketball players, but they're going to become better people and they have a great experience. So I, I appreciate you being on. It, it, it's like I said, I, I'm one of those guys that give me a chance to talk basketball with somebody and it'll be six hours later before I stop. <laughs> so I'd like to be able to revisit this at another time. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, great. Um, to kind of get a little more specifics on how people can find your camps and then, you know, outside of the Strongsville area, maybe, you know, maybe something grows from there. Yeah, I would love that. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate you reaching out to me. It's always great to connect with like-minded people and have an opportunity to talk. And like I said, my goal as I get older is to continue to grow the game and give back and because it's the game is, of basketball has been great to me. And being able to reach out and talk and have these kinds of conversations is really what, uh, you know, what I'm all about at this point. So it's been a pleasure. I appreciate you reaching out and giving me the opportunity. And hopefully everyone out there was able to find some value in, uh, in our conversation today. Great. So if you would give the people an idea of where to find you on hoop, uh, hoop heads and then uh, camp information as well. Absolutely. So uh, the camp website is headstartbasketball.com. And you can find out all the things that we're doing there from a basketball camp standpoint, training, all the different programs that we have. We also have on there, uh, there's a blog that uh, there's a lot of backlog of articles that since I started the podcast, I haven't written nearly as much, but there's a lot of good stuff for both basketball coaches, parents, and some player stuff on there as well. So that's headstartbasketball.com. And then the podcast is called the Hoop Heads Podcast. And that's available on all the major podcast apps. So you can find it on Apple Podcasts. You can find it on Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, YouTube. It's on, all, it's on all the big ones. And then we also have a website where you can go back and find all our old episodes. And that's hoopheadspod.com. And so for anybody who's out there that uh, if you're a basketball coach or you're the parent of a basketball player uh, or you're a basketball player yourself, we have, we've had some great guests on there. There's a, I think we're up to 170 episodes. So there's a lot to go back and listen to. And uh, we have a lot of fun with it. And hopefully uh, if you check it out, uh, you'll enjoy uh, some of the basketball conversations that we've been able to have with some, some really quality people, both well-known and some guys who you probably have never heard of that were equally as insightful as the guys that we've had on that everybody knows their name. So thanks for the opportunity to share. And if anybody has any questions for me, uh, my email address is headstartbasketball at usa.net that's the easiest way to to reach out to me okay thank you sir i appreciate it like i said it's, absolutely it's great to talk basketball any time of the day with anybody but it's better to talk with you yeah appreciate it frank thanks for the opportunity to come on yep absolutely thank you, thank you.